breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my wrong. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Welcome to Cross Point Church. My name is Rob, I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. Today, we're starting a brand new series called Rebound. And I love the premise of this series because everybody misses it in life at some point. Even the best shooters in the NBA don't make it every single time. Take one of the best shooters in the NBA right now, Steph Curry. Do you know that his career field goal average, that means the amount of baskets that he makes is only 48%. So that means that he misses it actually 52% of the time and we hail him as one of the best shooters of all time. 
You know, the Christian life is not about shooting 100%. The Christian life is about how you respond when you miss. How do you rebound? Over the next several weeks, it's our hope that this series will bring some hope and encouragement to you in your life. Hey, next week, we're so pumped because it's our friend day and we're bringing out an In-N-Out truck and giving away free In-N-Out burgers to everybody who comes. If that's not a good reason to invite your friends to Friend Day, then I don't know what is. So make sure this week that you're inviting your friends to Friend Day. We'll have a service here at Cross Point Campus at 9.30, and we'll have two online services at 9.30 and 11 a.m. Hey, if you're new here at Crosspoint, I want you to text the number below and we would love to send you a gift. And this is a gift that's just saying thanks so much for being with us today. Okay, I want you to start thinking about the most happy experience that you've ever had in your life. In fact, start thinking about the different experiences you've had throughout your life. What are you picturing? My guess is that you're picturing the people that were around you during those experiences. You know, the people that surround you during life, that's what makes life go from mundane to fun. And that's why here at Crosspoint, we have growth groups. It's a community of people who meet every single week to grow closer to each other and closer to God. We really do believe that if we are intentional to be around people, who are pursuing a relationship with God, who are pursuing going God's way over the world's way, it could actually transform our experience. We came to re-engage because we had become roommates. We were looking forward to learning some new things to help improve our marriage. There was an infidelity and a pornography addiction that she wasn't aware of. We were headed for divorce. We heard it was a safe place to reconnect with your spouse. And I had an affair and I was ready to leave my family for it. We were in a downward spiral in our marriage. Uh, we were just constantly fighting. The first time we walked into Reengage, I actually felt hope. I was just very nervous to see what was going to be revealed. I felt, finally, this is a place where I do not have to pretend. This class would require sharing and transparency, which was not something that I was used to. I really didn't want to tell people about what was going on in our marriage. I was very fearful. Uh, being an atheist, I had never willingly walked into a church. And I was so grateful as we walked in that there were people there to greet us that were so kind. The first time I walked into Reengage, I felt hope and peace. It was the first time I had ever heard people talk about really hard things they had been through and also hear that it could be okay. One of the biggest things I realized was that I was the biggest problem in our marriage, not my spouse. I had blocked out feelings, not only from my wife, but also from myself. We did an amazing job sweeping conflict under the rug, which over the years just resulted in resentment and uh, mistrust. Terry and I have been married for 19 years, and there are still areas that we can improve on. One of the biggest things I realized going through Reengage was how God's Word came alive. God actually had designed marriage. Our reengaged couples poured love into us and accepted us uh, without any expectation. And there was a, a true desire to understand and not necessarily judge what I was doing. One of the things I, I liked about reengage was being able to share our story, talk about it freely in a safe environment. Now our marriage is characterized as one full of love and grace. Our marriage is characterized by putting Christ at the center. Daily prayers. A lot of laughter. It's not perfect, but our disagreements are now opportunities. If you're considering coming to re-engage, the one thing I would want you to know is that you will be surprised at the relationships that you'll build there. It's worth giving God an opportunity to come in to your marriage. We have all sorts of groups for every age and life stage. So I wanna encourage you to sign up for a growth group today. It's as easy as texting growth group to 94,000. And don't hesitate because we only have a couple more weeks of our groups being open. Otherwise, you'll miss out. So make sure and text that number today and be a part of a growth group this fall. There's a lot of things that we have to do with our money. We have to pay our bills. We have to pay our taxes. We have to buy groceries. And those things aren't bad. Well, taxes, they're still up in the air. But I don't know about you, but I don't get a lot of personal satisfaction from spending my paycheck on those things. 
I mean, they are necessities. You, you got to do it. But it's not like I'm smiling when I'm paying the electric bill. But every now and then, I get to do something with my money. A little present that I get to buy for my kids just because. Or taking my wife out to dinner for an amazing dinner. Helping someone else in need. Now, that's how I feel when I give to God through the ministry of Cross Point Church. I don't feel like I have to give. I feel like I get to give. And when I give freely by choice, as I've decided to do, that gives me so much satisfaction. I, I may not feel much when I pay bills online, but when I give to the church, I know that I'm choosing to do something eternally good with money. You know, giving, it's a sign of faith and trust, but it also, it provides great satisfaction. Truly, I've never regretted one dollar that I've ever given to Cross Point Church. And today, you have the opportunity to give to something that's making a difference. You have the opportunity to give generously to a church that's doing good in this community right now in this season. So today, I want to challenge you to be generous and faithful in your tithes and offerings. You can give online today, or you can text to give using the number below. But better yet, I want to challenge you to automate the important. Sign up for reoccurring giving so your church can continue to step into the future with boldness. By automating your giving, you're helping your church plan and prepare for the future. And when you financially support your church, you are a link on the chain of helping other people find and follow Jesus.
Hey, welcome to Cross Point Church. We are so glad that you are with us today. Uh, today is our very first day to regather back together uh, here on the church campus since mid March. Uh, we've done a couple of things outside, but we are so excited to regather together, uh, man, with just the assembly, the church collectively together. So, no matter if you are here in person today, uh, or else you're watching online, or maybe you're you're watching this on demand even later in the week, uh, we believe that you are at the right place at the right time. And we recognize that some of you today may not feel comfortable just yet coming back to the church property. And so uh, I'm so grateful and thankful that we have this online uh, opportunity to be able to do this as well. And so grateful and thankful for just our production team and, and uh, man, our, our staff, as well as the volunteers uh, that come in to do this each and every week uh, just to make this accessible. But I also want to challenge you as well, because while online is a good thing, uh, I believe believe the best thing is for us to come together as a church when you feel comfortable to be able to do that. I believe that online is a good supplement, but it's not a good substitute. Man, we, we need community. We need to be in relationship uh, with one another as well. And, and one of my concerns is that the more you miss church, the less you may miss church. And can I tell you that the church is God's idea. It is God's plan for you to be in community, for you to be a part of a church family. And, and the church, the, it's the hope of the world. And I believe that, that there's no plan B. God's plan A was the church. It's you, it's me uh, collectively coming together for worship, for prayer, for communion, so many things. And somebody say, well, well, why do we need the church? Why is the church important? Because the church is a family. 
And you need to be part of a spiritual family. And a Christian that doesn't have a church family is an orphan. And God has brought so many of you here to be part of the Crosspoint Church family. When you're part of a church, you're part of a spiritual community, a spiritual family together. Can I tell you, I love our family. I love you. I love that our church is regathering together again. Man, we've not been closed. We've been open this whole entire time. God's used you in incredible ways, but there's something special about the family coming together. And you might ask, well, why do you need a spiritual family? And I would say that there's a few reasons. The first is because you need healthy relationships. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter four specifically speaks about relationships. And it says that two are better than one. You know, that life, we, it's not meant to be lived as a solo sport. That God says two are better than one. You, you know what God said whenever he was creating Adam in and, and the Garden of Eden? He said, it's not good for man to be alone. And you know, if God's plan was, was Zoom, he just would have, you know, Zoomed in his whole message, but he didn't. See, he brought his son Jesus to the earth, person on person, life in life. He, he is the representation of God. Why? Because he knew that healthy relationships were so important. And Ecclesiastes says two are better than one, for they have a better return, a better reward when two are together. Then it says, but I pity the man who falls down and has no one to help him back up. I call this God's Mr. T verse. Remember Mr. T? Mr. P, Mr. T said, I pity the fool. And God says, I pity the man that, has, that goes down. I pity the woman that goes down. It has no one there to help lift them back up. See, you need a church because you need healthy relationships. And the, the next thing that you need a church for is you need a place to use your gifts. Can I just tell you you're gifted? I mean, look at the person next to you right now and just say, congratulations, you're gifted. See, God has given you a gift. He has a purpose and a plan for you. And 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, do not neglect the gift that God has given you. And being a part of a church family allows you to be able to use the God-given gifts that he's given you and with other people as part of the body of Christ. So you need a place to use your gifts. And there's a third reason why you need a church. You need healthy relationships. You need a place to use your gifts. And the church is a place where you grow. It's a place where you grow spiritually. And, and God says that we need to study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That you need a place to grow spiritually. And spiritually, you're either climbing or you're sliding. There's no neutral. There's no stand still. And the church is how you spiritually connect with God. It's how you grow in your faith. So you need a place, you need healthy relationships. You need a place to use your gifts. This is a place where you're going to grow. And finally, this is a place where you get to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Romans chapter 12 says that, that you're part of the body and you're part of something bigger than just your space, just your place in this earth, that you're part of something grander, something more significant, which is God's plan of the church. Guys, we get to be a part of the church and I, I love the church. I'm grateful for the church. I'm so thankful that the church is gathering back together. Now, can I just be transparent with you? Just let me be vulnerable for a moment. This is uh, confessions of a sinful pastor. I, I have these two thoughts that have been in my mind and they're both completely opposite from one another. I mean, on, on one hand, I've got this thought that everything's gonna go back to normal, that, that everything's gonna be okay, that, that you know, there's, there's opportunity and in, in uncertainty. And I have this thought that, that, you know what, I can do this. I can do this. But I have this other thought as well. Maybe you do too. That things are never going to go back to normal. That things are not okay. Things are terrible. 
I have this thought that I wonder is, are people going to regather? Are people going to come back to the church? And I have this, this thought of, I can't do this. And I have both of these thoughts going on at the same time. And sometimes I have the same thoughts on the same day. Sometimes I have these two competing thoughts happening in the same hour. I'm, I'm grateful and thankful I can't think two thoughts at the exact same time. You know, you got both of these things going back and forth. And this is a weird season that we find ourselves in. I mean, we've overheard the phrase, unprecedented times. You know, Pastor Matt said something to me that just resonated with me. He, he said this. He said, I hope when I say, remember when, it's referring to these days we're living in now and not the pre-COVID days. I thought that was pretty profound. You know, in times of uncertainty in my life and definitely in the season that we find ourselves in right now, I find myself praying this prayer. This is a prayer that I pray often, and I invite you to pray the same prayer. And the prayer is this, God, I'll do the possible, but I'm asking you to do the impossible. God, I'll do the possible. I'll be faithful. I'll be in your word. I'll do what you call me to do. I'll do the next right thing. But God, I'm asking you to do the impossible. I can't change someone else's heart, someone else's thoughts, someone else's beliefs. There's things in this world that I cannot control. So God, in this time of uncertainty, I'll do the possible. But God, I'm asking you to do the impossible, the thing that I, I can't control. You know, I believe that one of the strongest, strongest biblical parallels to the season and the time that we find ourselves in right now is the story of Noah. And some of you, you know this famous story of Noah and the ark and Noah and the animals. But, but some of you, you think this is a kid's story. I mean, a lot of times we think of Noah and the ark and we think of kids. And, and you know, even here at our church, we, we've got this unbelievable kids ministry and we've got this preschool area, and nursery area, and it's all decorated like Noah's ark meets modern day times. I mean, it's, it's magnificent. But a lot of times we think, oh, it's, it's a kid's story. C can I tell you, this couldn't be further from a kid's story. I mean, th this is a story about people that turn their back on God. People that, that chose to go the world's way instead of God's way. Not just that, they kind of stuck their middle finger up at God. They said, we're going to do what we want to do. God calls that attitude sin, S-I-N. I am in the middle. I will do what I want to do. And because of their sin, listen, God said there's consequences for sin. And he gave them time and time and time again to turn around, man, to, to get back going God's way. But they continue to refuse. And finally, God had had enough. And he said, I'm going to send a storm and a flood because this world is being corrupted by so much sin that is happening. And so God caused this great storm to happen. Now, some of you just have a Sunday school understanding of Noah and the ark. Some of you today, uh, because of your intellect, because of science, you may be tempted to kind of go flat brain right now. Just kind of check out because you don't agree with all the science around Noah and the ark. And I I'm going to ask you just to stay leaned in. Don't, don't check out, even if you don't believe in some of the science behind this, because I believe that you're going to hear some principles behind it that I think can be impactful for your life. You know, Noah and the ark, a, a few years, or it was actually last year, my wife and I, uh, we took our family, I got invited to speak at a conference in Kentucky. And uh, I knew we were going to be close to this place where they had this replica of Noah's ark. And I brought a few pictures for you today. I mean, this is me taking this picture. I mean, this thing is massive. Uh, they spent over $30 million on this exhibit of Noah's ark that would be a life-size, exactly true replica. I got another picture here of uh, me and my family, just to kind of show you. Looks like it's a fake background, but it's not. That's the ark uh, there right behind us. And, and we were going right up to the door of the ark, and you can just kind of see the scale of this thing. 
thing of us getting ready to, to go inside. And just so you can see how massive uh, this ark really is. I mean, this is the, the size. And we've got this beautiful picture here too of, of just showing this, this magnificent ark. I mean, the story of Noah and the ark. Now, I want to share with you a few things that you may not be familiar with in a story. Did you know that they were in the ark for over a year? You know, a lot of times people think that they were in it for 40 days and 40 nights and they stepped out and bam, there's a rainbow. That isn't how that went down. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but they were in the ark for over a year. Imagine being, being stuck into the confines of, of this ark for, for over a year. I mean, it parallels today and just the experience that I believe that we're going through as well. God told Noah, he said, go build an ark. Invite people to come onto the ark. Invite people to be saved from this storm that's going to happen. And then he said, go in with all of your, your family members. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment of being stuck with your family for a long period of time. Can you imagine that? Some of you have experienced the exact same thing. And after six months, they were probably like, uh, are we almost done? You know, Noah, he brought his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I know they sound like the three stooges, okay, as far as their names. But I just imagine Ham, like going up to his dad saying, what are we doing? We're going to go on an ark. What's an ark? He's like, it's this this big boat. God told us that we got to protect ourselves. And and then Ham gets in. They've been in for a little while. He's like, dad, how long are we going to be in this thing? And, and, you know, I'm sure Noah's like, oh, a couple weeks. Maybe a couple weeks. He didn't know how long it was going to rain. And then after a couple weeks, they're like, dad, how long are we going to be in this thing? I mean, they, they had no clue. They had no idea. They didn't get daily updates from the governor. They just knew we got to trust some people that maybe they know what they're doing. He's saying, what's the plan? And and Noah's saying, the plan is this. God told us to get in the ark. We don't know how long we're going to be in an ark. And we've got to trust God while we were in the ark. I wonder what they were doing. Have you ever thought about that? I wonder if they ever played hide and go seek in the ark, (laughs) hiding in the animal pens. I wonder if the daughter-in-laws got along for a long period of time while they're all here in this ark, this, this quarantine state. Here they are trusting God. Genesis chapter 8 verse 1 says this. It says, but God remembered Noah. I love that phrase. Because I want to let you know that if you're a child of God, God remembers you. God knows you. No longer how, no matter how long you've been in a storm, no longer how long the storm has been raging, God sees you. He knows you. He knows you by name. God remembered Noah and all the wild animals. People say, does God care about animals? Yeah, he cares about animals. He cared about the livestock, cared about all of them that were there in the boat. And he sent a wind to blow across the earth and the floodwaters began to recede. And the underground waters stopped flowing and the torrential rains from the sky, they were stopped. So the floodwaters gradually receded from the earth after how long? 150 days. Exactly five months from the time the flood began the boat came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. So I I want you to know, first of all, they were in the ark for at least a week before it started raining. Then they're in the ark. They were there. It it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. Then five months later, it docks at Mount Ararat. Now, they still didn't get off the boat. And the reason why is because there was so much mud and goo everywhere that that they couldn't step on. There wasn't dry ground to step on. So they had to stay on it. Just the moment they think, this is it. We're going to be able to get out. It's over. Nope. They got to stay on the ark a little bit longer. I think it parallels so close to where we're at right now. So the timing was off. And I find this interesting that timing is so important. God remembered Noah and at just the right 
time is whenever they got off the ark. And God's perfect timing. Timing is so important in life. You know, John Maxwell is a great leadership coach, author, former pastor, and he wrote this very famous book called 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And law number 17 is the law of timing. And and here's what John Maxwell says about timing. He says, reading a situation and knowing what to do are not enough to make you succeed in leadership. If you want your organization, department, or team, or I would add family, to move forward, you must pay attention to timing. He he goes on, and here's what he says about timing. He says, you, you can do the right thing in the wrong time, and it's the wrong thing. See, it's so important to get your timing lined up so that you're getting everything together in the perfect time. Now, we don't always know what the perfect time is. That's why we trust God. And I love the fact that God's timing is always right. God's never early. God's never late. God is always right on time. So, here they are, they, they, they land on Mount Ararat, and at just the right time, God says, okay, it's okay to disembark now. So here they come off the ark. I mean, it's, it's Shem, Ham, Japheth, it's, it's the family, it's the kids. I mean, here comes the animals, pigs, donkeys, everything is coming off the ark. And I just wonder how they felt coming out of that ark. I think some of us can relate with that right now, maybe more so than we ever could, could have before in our life. I don't think they ever stopped talking about the ark. I think they told stories for the rest of their life. And I think you are going to tell stories to your family and your children and your grandchildren for years and years to come about this time and this season that you've been quarantined, that you've been in your own proverbial ark. And the question is, what do we do when we're in this ark? Man, I think this is a time of preparation. This is a time of seeking God. You know, God's just been putting in my heart, my spirit, just the power of prayer. How important it is to lean into our relationship with God in this season. To say, God, blow a fresh wind through me. God, you're doing something in our country right now. I don't quite understand it. I don't know what it is, but something is going to come out of this. I don't know what is going on. There is uncertainty, but God, you're you're here. You're in the middle of this. So God, blow a fresh wind. Show me what you want me to do. And when I think about Noah and his family stepping out of the ark, of how the world looked different, pre-flood and post-flood. There were some things that significantly changed. I'm sure they had some feelings saying, I I just, I want to go back to the way it was before. I'm sure some were like, man, my, my favorite vacation destination is gone. What happened? For them, their family dynamics had changed. There were things that were, were changing but they also had opportunity to reinvent as well. They got to build. There were new things that came out of this this season. You know, I I wanna just take you on a journey for a moment and and I I wanna ask you just to kind of process what we're going through right now. Because I believe that we're getting close possibly to getting off of this ark, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but What's going to happen when we do? What do we need to reinvent? What is God speaking into your heart, your mind? What what is God reshaping? Because some of you are asking some very big questions right now. Some of you are wondering about your job. Some of you are, are wondering right now about your future. You're wondering and you're considering moving. You're wondering what does school look like? How is this going to impact some of you are are freshmen in college and some of you are thinking, what does this look like? Some of you are taking some time off. I mean, there's so much that has just impacted us. And and my heart breaks for some of you because I'm hearing stories about families that are disconnecting right now because you spent so much time together. There's been a lot of headbutting and a lot of fighting. 
Some of you are even considering divorce or separation. And I, I want to tell you, I want you to lean into God right now. I want you to listen to me closely because we have support for you. There's some help. Don't make any major decisions when you're in the valley. It's not a good time to make decisions. And we here at Crosspoint, we're opening up groups for you. We've got online groups. We've got in-person groups. Listen, if you're struggling in your marriage, you need to get to marriage point. Listen, we have a great program that has literally helped hundreds of people in our church and in our community. You need to sign up for Marriage Point. Listen, some of you are financially, man, you're struggling. You need some support on budgeting, on communication, on where does the money go and how do we get on the same page? Uh, And I want to tell you, we've got support for you. We have financial peace that's getting ready to start. Listen, some of you have fallen back into some addictions. You've fallen back into alcohol to help you cope through this. And and you've gone back into some drugs. You've gone back into some things. And I want to tell you that God is saying, listen to me. I want you to go my way. That's why we're starting groups and community and friendships and relationships online and in person to be able to help support you in your journey. Listen, this is one of the last weeks to sign up for a group. You need to sign up. It's for 12 weeks. Go on a spiritual growth journey right now. Reinvent, reshape. You need to do this right now. Now, I want to tell you what's happening in our country and just kind of walk you through what Noah went through, what I think we're going through too. And and I'm going to show you some shapes. I'm going to show you some some letters. The first one is a V. And this is whenever everything kind of fell back in March. But there's some things that are going to bounce back up really quickly. I'm sure for Noah, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, this went down, uh, but man, this is going to bounce back real quick. Okay, we're going to get this thing going again. We're going to eat again. We're going to come together as a family. All, all kinds of things to know. I want you to think about what's the V in your family? What's the V in your personal life right now? What's the things that went down, but they're going to bounce back up and they're going to come back quick. But then I want you to look at this next letter. It's the U. This is things went down and there's going to be a little pause. It's not a V. It's not going to immediately come back, but it's going to take a little bit of time but it will come back. It just looks a little different right now. What are some of those things in your life? Where are you saying, God, I don't want to let go of this because I just need to be patient. God, where are you calling me to be patient right now? Where do I just need to sit and trust with you? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. He's just saying, you need to be a little patient, but I'm going to bring it back. It's coming back. It's not going away. Now, this next letter I want you to look at, this shape is L. This is stuff that it went down and it's not coming back. It's done. It's over. It's it's not coming back. And you need to just have a little little memorial, a little burial, and say, it's dead. It's not coming back. What's died right now? What is it you need to mourn and grieve over, but then you need to let it go? It's, It's in the past. There it is. And then there's some things that I believe are like a J. Maybe you got them started a little bit before pre-COVID, but now this is a time to reinvent and it's going to come back greater levels than ever has before. You know, for me, this was family dinners. You know, we, we ate together as a family a couple times a week, but now it's significant. I mean, we're eating together five, six times a week, all collectively together. I love that. That's not going to change in my family. I want to do everything we can to protect that time that we have together, that we can continue to build memories together and that relationship. Man, what is it in your life? What what are the V's? What are the U's? What are the L's? What are the J's? And I got an easy way for you to remember this. J-Love. This is the J-Love conversation. Not the J-Lo, the J-Love. J L U V. And these would be some, some great questions for you to maybe process through with some friends. If you've got some close friends, say, hey, let, let's have some conversation around this. Maybe as a family today, you have a conversation, you say, you know, what are we happy to see go? Well, what, what is it right now that we're looking forward to? What is it we're looking forward to coming back? Well, what is it that's good for now? What is it that's new and exciting that I'm excited about? See, Noah could have lamented. He could have been sad about the past, but he reinvented. 
He said, God, blow a fresh wind through me. And God, show me what's next of what you want me to do. Listen, some of you, you haven't processed this time very well. Some of you have had some real struggles of anxiety. Some of you have have really crashed spiritually. Some of you are looking for some hope. You're looking for some answers. And and I want to let you know that God's been doing something new in my heart. And and I'm so excited about this brand new series that we're going to start next week. It's called Rebound. How do you rebound when you miss it in life? I was a basketball player, so I love basketball. And when you miss a shot, I'm watching the playoffs, guess what? You come in and you rebound and you get another opportunity. You get another shot at it. So we're going to talk about rebounding. Our country needs to rebound. Our faith needs to rebound. Our church needs to rebound. You need to rebound spiritually. Your marriage needs to rebound. Your finances need to rebound. Listen, emotionally, you need to rebound. So we're going to talk about five biblical principles that God has taught me that I can't wait to share with you. Five things that you need to understand about a rebound. And this is going to be so good for you. And and it's going to be good for you future too. I want you to write notes. I want you to take notes about what God's word says to us about when you miss it in life. How do you get back up? I mean, Proverbs says a righteous man falls down, but he gets back up. So how do we rebound? How do we get back up? So we're going to go on a 40-day spiritual growth journey together starting next Sunday. You don't want to miss it. So we're going to celebrate coming together next Sunday. If you feel comfortable, we've got different options. You can come here and you can be in your car and you can listen on your radio. You can come outside and we've got an outdoor gathering and and people are wearing masks. We've got opportunities inside as well. You can come into the worship center. We've got a special family service just for you with kids. And you can sing kids songs. It's going to be a kid-friendly environment. You're going to go there with your family together, but you'll watch my message collect together. And then we've got the safe zone. The safe zone is in the Hope Center. Listen, masks are required. It's going to be the ultimate safest place. You've got your own private entrance to go in. Listen, we're, we're going to make sure that it's safe, it's cautious. We're going to become all things to all men that we might reach some. And why are we doing this? We're doing this because we believe that the church is essential. We've got to come together. So I hope that you'll be with us on this series next week. Make a decision to be a part with us for all five weeks of the series. And and we're going to do something cool. Everybody that is a part of the series, all five weeks, we've got some Crosspoint swag that we're going to give to you. And that's if you're in person, and here's how we're going to do it, by you checking in. If you check in on Facebook, you check in. That's how we'll know that you've been here for all five weeks. And even if you can't make it to the campus and you want to check in online, you can check in from the comfort of your own home. We would encourage you, though, to check in for all five weeks. Don't miss a service. And we're all going to collectively come together. And next week is Friend Day. So if you're watching online, we want you to share it, get the word out to your friends that we're starting this new series, Rebound. If you're here and people feel comfortable coming back to the service, we want to encourage you to invite a friend. Listen, right now, text somebody, call somebody, let somebody know. And next week, we're going to celebrate what God has done in this season. And we're doing free in and out hamburgers. So we've got in and out trucks coming to church next Sunday. And man, we're going to have burgers galore. All right. So it's going to be a great time to come together free in and out. But more importantly than that, it's being spiritually fed. You're going to be spiritually fed next week. I hope that you will make it as we start this brand new series called Rebound. And the final thing I want to let you know is this. In this new season, you're going to need faith. I don't know when the last days are. Maybe we're living in them right now. Maybe we're not. No man knows the day or the hour. But I think it's ludicrous for us to prepare for retirement. Ludicrous for us to prepare for everything in life. You've got insurance. You've got everything that you're preparing for whatever's going to happen. It's ludicrous for us not to prepare for eternity. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I believe that's the most important decision you could ever make. And here's how you do that. It's by confessing your sin. It's by saying, I'm not enough. S-I-N, I have been in the middle of my life, but God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. 
I want to invite you just to pray that prayer with me right now. Just say, dear God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and take full control of my life today. Today, I'm declaring you the boss, the coach, and the CEO of my life. So God, you lead me, you guide me, you direct me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, I wanna be the first to congratulate you, welcome you to the family of God. And we're passionate, not just about you finding Jesus, but you following Jesus. So man, we've got some resources that we wanna give you and put in the mail this week. So if you'll just text the number below, we'll send it out to you. And uh, we are so glad that you guys are here, part of the Crosspoint family. Listen, if you need any special prayer, man, let us know, crosspoint.com slash prayer. Your church is here for you. And I can't wait to see you again next Sunday at Friend Day. Hey, thanks again for joining us for church. Again, if you made any decision to follow Jesus, text the number below and we'd love to reach out to you and help you on this new journey of following Jesus. Have a great day. Jesus, you have been so faithful. I sure do have a lot of friends. I have 2,762 of them. Uh, I met this girl in kindergarten and then she moved away after that. And oh, this guy friended me after I gave him my seat on the bus. And I have no idea who this person is. Hmm. I may have 2,762 friends on here, but I think I really only know like 10 of them. I... Probably should have thought that through first. Anyway, real friends are people you should really know. So let me introduce myself if we haven't met. I'm Haley and I'm here to talk to you today about friendship. Friendship is using your words and actions to show others you care. You know how to tell who your real friends are? They show up in person, not just on your phone. 
They show up when you're happy and when you're having a party. They show up when you need help. They show up when you're sad and you need a shoulder to cry on. Real friends, your best friends, are there for you in the good times and the bad. Just like the two friends in today's story. They went through what every friendship goes through. The highs, the lows, running for your life from an angry king. Oh, okay, well, maybe not every friendship goes through that part. <gasps> I wonder if one of my 2,762 friends can fix a broken phone. Oh, I know, I'll just call someone. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's not gonna work. I'll be right back. Hey, man, how you doing? You got everything? Did you bring them? Uh, you know it. Oh, how about you? Oh, of course, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> then let's do this thing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure this is how you have a block party? Hello everyone, I'm Brandon. And I'm John, and this is The, the So-and-So so -and -so Show. On this show, John and I hang out here talking together about the world we live in. We learn a little something about God, and then we discover what it means to be human. Man, we do all that? Mm. We're good. I know, and today's no different. We've got a fun day planned, and we're gonna get started with a little game we like to call the $1,000 Triangle. John, show me the money. You don't have the money? I, I spent it all on olives. What? Never mind. okay, today, we're gonna play a little game called the 25, 26, 27, 28 dollar and 31 cent Woo! triangle. It's time for the 28 dollar and 31 cent triangle. All right, here's how the game works. I'm going to try and get John to guess the answer on each of these cards. Shouldn't be too tough because the category is famous duos, people or things that go together. John, are you ready to play $28.31 triangle? You bet I am, Brandon. Then let's play. <laughs> okay, here we go. Number one, uh, okay, this is something that you write with and something that you write on. Oh, a chisel and stone tablet. <laughs> no, it's a little more modern than that. Oh, a finger and an iPad. No, no, okay, think about this. This is very common. It's something you write with, something you write on. These are two things that go together. They are... The mortal and pastel! No, what? Pass, pass, next uh... one. All right, okay, you can get this one. This is, uh, okay, these are two things that taste great between two slices of bread. Oh, what is anchovies and mayonnaise? No. Oh, oh, ketchup and sugar. Uh, uh no, uh, okay, it's very, it's one of the most famous sandwiches you can oh, think oh, of. Oh, oh, to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Famous duos. Oh. Pass. Uh, oh, my. Uh, Vladimir and Estragon? Yeah. All right, uh, these, uh, okay, these are two of the coolest guys on the planet. Oh, oh, oh who's uh, Thomas Alva Edison, who invented the incandescent light bulb, and Sammy Hagar. No. No, no, these two guys, they have a lot of fun every week and help teach people about God and the Bible. Oh, Mel Solomon and Greg. Uh, no, these two guys are the hosts of the so-and-so show. Steven and Lawson? No, it's the people hosting the show right now. Right now, they're also playing the game, $28.31 triangle. Uh, they are. Uh, 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 it's me and you, John. Uh, me and you. Oh. Uh, Unbelievable. I was so close. You only got one right. But who eats peanut butter with jelly? I <laughs> mean, it's Bible story time with Kellen. Oh, man. Hello, my friends. How's it going? Pretty good, Kellen. John didn't know we were a famous duo. <laughs> oh, I thought we were a famous trio. Hey, you're right. That's why I missed it. Yeah. What story do you have for us today? 
Well, speaking of duos, today I want to talk about one of the most famous duos in history, David and Jonathan. And to help me do that, please welcome the So-and-So Show Players. Jonathan was the prince of Israel. Hi, I'm Jonathan. And his dad, King Saul, was the very first king of Israel. I am king. David was Jonathan's best friend. Hi, I'm David. He killed Goliath. He was a really mean giant. David was a national hero, and everyone loved him. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> and don't tell Saul and Jonathan this, but God had decided that David was going to be the next king of Israel. What'd he say? Uh, I'm just telling the story. Still, Jonathan loved David, and he gave his friend gifts that were good enough for a prince. Here, friend. It's my bow and arrow. Uh, thank you, best friend. <laughs> and my princely tunic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. <laughs> and mm -hmm. <sighs> my favorite pillow. <laughs> my favorite soccer ball. Thank you. <laughs> Hold on. There's more to come. And all of the important things. Oh, You'll sleep well with him. Th thank you. This will help you in a jam. Th thank you. And this will always... Provide the light just the way you want it. Oh, thank you. Jonathan probably didn't give David a lampshade, but you get the idea. They were best friends. Unfortunately, King Saul was jealous of David because everyone liked him so much. So King Saul sort of wanted to uh, kill David. Why does your dad want to kill me? What did I do? He's not gonna kill you. He, look, Dad tells me everything. He wouldn't keep something like that from me. Maybe he didn't tell you because he knows how close we are. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, oof. Mm. What do you want me to do? Hmm. I'm supposed to eat with the king at the new moon feast tomorrow. Tell them that I couldn't make it. And if he gets mad, then you'll know for sure he's trying to kill me. Can you do that? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. How will I know how your father reacts? Hmm. 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 I have an oddly over-elaborate plan that might just work. Mm -hmm. You see that stone out there? Yes. I want you to wait by that stone. That's After the feast, I'll come out with a servant, and I'll shoot three arrows into the field. Three. And if everything is okay, I'll say, look, the arrows are on this side of you. And if I find out that dad wants to kill you, I'll say, look, the arrows are far, far beyond you. And if I say that, then you definitely need to run. Okay? All right? Got it? Okay. Wait, why wouldn't you just send your servant no, out there no, to no, tell no, me? No. There's no time for discussion, okay? The game is in foot. Let's go. Go. On. Okay. The plan was in place. Everything was set. David had chosen not to eat with the king at the new moon feast. The only question was, how would King Saul react? Well, on the second night of the feast, King Saul noticed something was missing. Son? Yes, father? Where? Yes. Is? Yes. The cat's up! Oh, um, uh, it's, uh, all right here. All right, it's right here. Oh, thank you, thank you, <laughs> and, uh, thank you. I believe it's pronounced ketchup, last I heard. Ah, huh. yeah, well, <laughs> the more you know. Ah, uh, also, where? Yes, Father? Is... Yes, the, the, the mustard, um, it's right, right, right there. <laughs> yes. oh, thank you, thank yeah, you. No problem. Mm -hmm. There's a little red, a little yellow, makes a very mm -hmm. happy mm -hmm. fellow. Very good now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, son. Mm -hmm. Yes, father? Uh, where's David? Um, he wanted to go visit his family, so I let him go. What? 
Now, do you not realize that as long as he is alive, you will never be king? David must die! But he hasn't done anything! King Saul was so angry, he grabbed a spear and threw it at his own son. I'm going to throw this spear at you. No, no. You best run! No! You best run! Uh, not, not a pickle spear, an actual spear, but whatever. The spear missed Jonathan, and Jonathan had all the information that he needed. King Saul wanted to kill David, so it was time to send David the signal. Come, unnamed servant from the Bible, let's shoot some arrows into the field for no mysterious reason whatsoever. Shall I make the sound, sire? Oh, shall you make the sound? <laughs> Don't you always make the sound? Very Thank good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excellent marksmanship, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Now, run out into the field and collect those arrows. Uh, but they're just, they're just right there. Go! Okay. Hurry! Run fast! Don't stop! The arrows are far beyond you! I feel like you're not even looking at me. Just go! Run! Have I gotten there yet? Okay, okay, okay. I'm, there we oh, Got him. Got him. <laughs> Yahtzee. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Very well, lad. You take those weapons back to town. Okay. When the servant left, David came out of hiding and met his friend on the field one last time. Get up, get up, get up. Get up. Promise me you'll always be kind to my family even after my father is gone? I promise. In the name of the Lord, you and I have made a promise to be friends. It's not only a promise between us, but between our children after us. Yes. Go in peace. By protecting David that day, Jonathan saved the life of the future king of Israel. But more importantly than that, he saved his friend. The end. How about a hand for the so-and-so show players? Uh, wow, what an incredible story. I know, Jonathan was a prince, so by saving David, he was basically giving up the throne. And that's risking amazing. his life. I mean, Jonathan really laid everything on the line for his friend. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what friends do, isn't it? They love each other. They're patient and kind, they protect each other and never give up on each other. It's, it's like the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, love never fails. Never? Uh, I'm not sure I'm that good of a friend. No offense. No, but. I'm with you. It's true. I think if we really want to love like a true friend, we're going to need God's help. He knows more about love than anyone. Well, think about it. He sent his son, Jesus, to die for us so that we would know how important we are to him. Talk about laying everything on the line. Yeah, that's so true. Thanks, Kellen. You bet. I'll catch you guys later. See ya. Huh. Bye, Kellen. So if God went out of his way to show us how important we are to him, and if Jonathan went out of his way to show David how important he was, what, what does that mean for us? Don't ask me, ask them. All right, reveal the question. How can you show your friends they're important? Yeah, yeah, what are some ways you can show your friends they're important to you? Yeah, uh, maybe give them a wrapped apple. A wrapped apple? Yeah, they're healthy. Or maybe spend time with them. Oh, you don't even have to wrap the apple if you don't want to, just... Talk about it together. How can you show your friends they're important? Y you know, you've never even once given me an apple. 
I'm Brandon. Uh, and I'm John. And this was the So and So Show. Not even mashed or sauced. By, you would want a mashed apple? For, Absolutely. Like Haven't you ever had a mashed apple? What are you doing, Brandon? Well, I'm just taking a stroll around the block. Boo, 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 boo. Hey, you know what this is? Eh? It's a chip off the old block. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, stop being a stumbling block. I'll knock your block off, blockhead. <gasps> you got any more? No, I, I've got writer's block. Wouldn't it be cool to have a friendship as strong as David and Jonathan's? Those guys would do anything for each other. Jonathan even risked his life to protect David, but that's what friends do. They love each other no matter what. Okay, okay, not that kind of love. I'm talking about the kind of love this guy Paul wrote about in one of his letters. You can find the letter in your Bible. It's called the Book of 1 Corinthians. You wanna know what love is? Here's some of what Paul wrote. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not brag. It is not proud. It does not easily become angry. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It never gives up. Love never fails. That's how you show love to a friend. You're not impatient with them. You don't get angry easily. You protect them and you stand up for them. And you never ever fail. Wait, love never fails? That seems kind of difficult. The truth is, for us, it's kind of impossible to love without failing. If you really want to love your friends the way God wants you to love, you're going to need God's help. After all, he knows more about love than anyone. He loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for our sins. And with God's help, you can love people more than you could ever do by yourself. So the one thing to remember today is this. Friends love one another. Sometimes friends fail, but that's okay. Friends also forgive, which is a good thing because because this was my friend Erica's phone and I think she's gonna be like, and I'm gonna be like, Aah. and then we'll laugh about it <laughs> because she's a real friend and so am I. So I'm gonna find a way to get her a new phone. I think I'll show up and tell her in person. I mean, it's not like I'm gonna call her or text her. <laughs> okay, goodbye friends. See you next time.